did okay. It's not on the normal bar, so I thought maybe it oh. appeared off. You're so good to go. It dropped into the more. Yeah, so <laughs> it should be recording now. It is. Great. Thanks for the reminder. So welcome everybody um, uh, to the uh, 93rd monthly meeting of the Strong and Sustainable Business Model Group. Um, I'm Peter Jones, uh, a professor at OCAD University's Strategic Foresight and Innovation uh, Master's Program, and, and today's lead speaker um, the, will be Nicole Norris, a graduate of the SFI program, who I advised her major research project. I'd like to um, start with um, an acknowledgement of, of, our, of, of our environment. Uh, the physical world, the natural, the natural world in which we all live, and the, the place and the cultural meaning of that world that it may, ha may have for all of us uh, in different ways. And so, uh, and so in, uh, I'm located in Toronto, and, it's in, uh, and in the Don River watershed. We often will recognize the watershed and the, and the, the context of the, of the land. Um, here as we get started, but uh, I just like to to state kind of my sense of of you know the 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 environment that that we're in and that we're we're supporting and protecting and thinking of when we talk about um, we stop talk about strong sustainability and the ecosystem itself. And here the ecosystem in, includes a bioregion that has been continuously occupied by by human beings, uh, according to the Anishinaabe that we know, for up to 40,000 years of oral tradition. The, the recorded settlements, the well-known settlements, go back to the Huron-Wendat, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, or we also know as the Iroquois, and their confederacy now is the Six Nations, who, who are, are, are still all over the region, but Toronto itself, is and the, and the land around Toronto is um, is is held in particular stewardship by the Anishinaabe, the Mississaugas of the Credit River, and the, there's a treaty between the Haudenosaunee and the uh, and the Anishinaabe that we recognize the dish with one spoon, which is an early concept of of uh, of strong sustainability, which is the dish with one spoon is that you have one spoon for feeding everybody and you never you don't take more than you need and you replace what you what you've taken as well as you can to com continually replenish the land and the resources uh, so I invite you to consider the location that you're in and the the watershed and the original context of the land and how that's been used uh, the I think uh, most of us are, are regular participants but for those that are new wonder to say a little bit about the SSBMG, the community of practice, and, and a site for sharing research that for about eight years, we've been developing uh, between partnerships uh, out, of, out of OCAD and Anthony Upward from uh, York University's Ecological e Economics Group and, and from many other universities. We've been sharing research and learning from those in research and practice on designing enterprises that we consider fit for the future. Uh, and uh, we're a knowledge mobilization uh, group that is sharing uh, our cutting edge learning, cutting edge research as we're developing it. As in today's talk, uh, we have uh, uh, something of a global network of, of relationships that have been developed over time through the various research communities. And this has grown into you know, the quite a rich uh, community. We, um, there are f uh, five different kind of research streams or streams of practice as well that, that, are, uh, uh, that are available for collaboration. Um, a lot of the information for this is, uh, can be followed at our, our site, um, wiki.ssbmg.com and under drive.ssbmg.com we have recordings of all the past presentations, all of which are fantastic. So I recommend that. And so the, the, uh, as most of you know, the, the normative intent, that is our, our mission and vision, is really wrapped around the, the growing and worldwide movement for 
creating flourishing in our communities through the enterprise. And the enterprise level or the meso level of complex social ecosystems is where we believe the action is and where change can happen very effectively through um, multiple levels of the system from working with organizations. And, and uh, we believe in working closely with uh, to, uh, to a, uh, the uh, transdisciplinary sciences as a system science in working with indigenous knowledges and uh, ethical frameworks uh, of practice. And, and to some extent, we're uh, aligned with the sustainable development goals, but we're also known as critics really of the, of the, S S the SDGs as they're framed today, that they're essentially weakly sustainable and grounded in the, the, the kind of older view of sustainable development. There, there are steps on the way. We are trying to leap well ahead beyond sustainable development into flourishing. And so as part of this movement, there are many different organizations that, that, um, that you may be part of and participating with. And, and these become something of, something of a, not just a community of practice, but together of, of movements for change across organizations that are taking up the work that we're, that we're engaged in. We consider this a, our, our work to be part of a collaboration hub um, and, the, and it's spun off in the last year, the Flourishing Enterprise Institute, which is um, in which we're engaged in developing the, the, the first kind of strong uh, presence or the, the node for, for, for research into uh, community and, and enterprise flourishing in our partnership with the Veris Institute at, um, at Wilfrid Laurier University. And so that's, uh, and there are other hubs for, for strong sustainability practices that we recognize aim to flourish. The, our 3.0 community, Lean for Flourishing, um, and to, to mention some, and so we we um, we encourage you to to get in, in involved and, and to share your work as well. Um, uh, there are a number of conferences that we're engaged in, and some which are that are coming up. We mentioned before the Systemic Design Association um, RSD uh, nine. Um, still sponsored at uh, National Institute of Design India um, during the um, um, in the middle of October over that whole week uh, it will be once we have the program out the um, conference for uh, R3.0 is its seventh conference um, held through the Netherlands is the second week of September um, next year but there are ongoing workshops throughout the year as well so uh, encourage people to stay stay closely in touch. So you may have met and heard from earlier um, our community animators, Dr. Tim Posselt, who's now also working through Waterloo and so is in the GTA or in the uh, Southern Ontario region from time to time, but today is back in Germany, yeah. And uh, Lori Farley uh, from Calgary. So thanks for, for helping and for joining us. And so uh, today's discussion will be kicked off very shortly by Nicole Norris and uh, Maya Hovskog um, for, um, uh, for a discussion on, on, our, on the improving the flourishing business canvas through design and the experiments held at the European universities that Maya and Francesca and Susie work with. So we'll be um, starting that very, very shortly. At this point, if, you're, if you've joined us during my introduction, introduce yourself uh, in the chat. And um, so we can, especially if you're new, or if we may not have noticed because the way Zoom works, we're just kind of sequence seeing, we don't always see when people join, we have to kind of um, um, slide, through, slide through the uh, faces as we get a chance. So I'd like to introduce um, Nicole Norris and her approach to the to the um, uh, the research uh, conducted uh, last year and actually continuing this year as well, onto the improvements of the of the flourishing business canvas. And so I won't say too much, but I just want to give kind of a general introduction uh, and a personal introduction as the as her principal advisor in her major research project. Uh, her as with um, ex exploratory 
um, research studies that are led by design, sometimes the more that they are design led, the more kind of creative license kind of finds its way into the project. And, and, and things start to emerge that might not have done if you had followed kind of a research project from start to finish in the way that many normal research projects are done. And so it's a, the original goal of, of Nicole's MRP, and, and this was actually done, was to advance the development of the Flourishing Business Canvas in the context of evaluation, particularly in the Georgian um, college community of rural small medium enterprise ecosystems. And so the, the intent was to, you know, was to ensure that the, the kind of toolkit for um, um, the, you know, the Flourishing Business Canvas as used could be used by this very important um, um, business con uh, context to small business owners and and uh, managers and other participants in that ecosystem so that we could evaluate, I mean, so so much of the canvas has really been developed in in uh, either high tech or in, in, in well-recognized sustainability contexts, businesses that already had an orientation to, to sustainability and, and in urban settings. And so Nicole started with this focus on just designing for the enhancements of the canvas and and doing evaluations kind of like as if it were a usability context to ensure that we had, you know, that you could uh, maximize the accessibility, the usability, and the, and, and the points of use, the understanding of the ontology and the, and, and the terminology used in the canvas. And so there's, this was also done with, her MRP was also done at the same time as a companion study being held within at Georgian College in the regional small medium enterprise ecosystem, and that study is still ongoing. We're 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 we're, we're planning um, more workshops this year if those can be done remotely. But Nicole's study then started connecting with um, Maya's work and and for Francesco Stuzzi at, at Halmstad in Sweden and Ghent in Belgium, conducting um, workshops in their um, in their context led to. Um, creating diff actually a different format for the canvas. And so this was a turn towards research through design. And so the study's methodology took an approach that we might call, uh, that we recognize as R2 RTD, research through design, which is um, an approach to design research where the research itself follows the, the practices of design. So as, as different turns in the artifacts, are, are created and not even necessarily evaluated. It's not a usability approach. It really is design led, even if there were evaluations done. The art, the research through design is exploring through the lens of design itself and record and reporting on that process, reflection on what's been learned through design as the content of the research itself. So this isn't always an easy idea to to get across, especially a more rigorous design science approach, uh, which has kind of led to a lot of the artifacts as you've seen them, but it led to some very creative outcomes. So I'm 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 proud to introduce uh, Nicole uh, to kick this off with uh, Maya, and uh, and why don't you go ahead and and share your deck from here? I think I've turned it over, and I'll go ahead and stop mine. Okay, thank you, uh, Peter. Nicole, are you ready? <laughs> I am, or, or is Nicole ready? <laughs> is Nicole ready? <laughs> We're good, yeah. So I just wanna take an opportunity to, thank you, Peter, for the, the really kind introduction. Um, but I also really wanna give a lot of credit to, to Maya. Like we could not have done, well, I could not have done my MRP uh, without the help of Maya and Francesca. Uh, just the fact that uh, they were so willing to sort of go along on this crazy journey um, you know, so much more came out of the research just from a personal standpoint as well, too. So I know we often don't talk about the relationships that we build in our communities, but, um, you know, we're going to talk a little bit about that. And Maya is going to lead this discussion because just on her brilliance of what uh, the contribution there. But, you know, just personally, I just really enjoyed this opportunity to get to learn the community and build some relationships. Um, so that's what I'll add because the research will speak for itself and Mai's going to really kick this off because 
she's so brilliant at what she does and and uh so many of you know her so uh take her away <laughs> oh uh no no pressure nicole <laughs> <laughs> do you see my presentation yeah uh, do you mind sharing it in full screen so it's a little bit bigger yeah yeah i will do i um I'm a little bit tired after intense day of teaching. We already started um, um, teaching again, so um, please bear with me. <laughs> okay, I also want to um, thank uh, Nicole and also the community because um, without being part of this community, we would never have met and uh, had so much fun in, in doing this, uh, this uh, research. And the presentation that uh, we are going to walk you through together with Nicole today uh, is presenting our ongoing work uh, with, um, as uh, Peter said, um, with, also with Francesca uh, from Belgium who couldn't uh, join us uh, today. And it was also presented at the beginning of July uh, at the new business model conference. Um, as it was on one of the slides that you presented, Peter, as well. And I'm really excited also to, to share with you that uh, the next edition of the conference, the New Business Model Conference, will be actually in Sweden. And I really hope that we will be able to meet in person, but let's see how the situation develops over the, the, the fall. So with no further ado, um, Peter did a great introduction of Nicole and uh, Francesca um, uh, is an um, industrial designer. Nicole is specialized in interface design and I'm a little bit the uh, odd bird <laughs> because I'm an associate professor in innovation management. Um, so um, my design skill and knowledge are quite, uh, uh, quite low. However, I'm quite interested and in my work in the last years has been on business models for sustainability from a managerial perspective um, and the process perspective. So how we organize the process, what type of stakeholders we are uh, involving over time and what kind of tools um, um, could be used. Um, so, um, you sense that already that the interest towards tools led to the meeting that uh, basically fate brought us together and the community brought us together, the three of us. Um, um, and we actually, um, I'll tell you about a little bit uh, later where we met with uh, Nicole. So we will guide you. Um, it's a really standard uh, format of the presentation, but as I said, this introduces our ongoing work and how we have been thinking. Um, so um, our inspiration um, for this research is uh, the quote and the idea that uh, tools are really helping uh, individuals to uh, come up with a radically new um, ways of thinking. Um, and thus the central role of tools and uh, usability um, and also making important that all these tools that the community for business models for sustainability is generating actually widespread and are adopted in practice. So this well aligns uh, with uh, one of the ideas of the strongly sustainable um, business groups to basically spread, diffuse the knowledge that we generate at a faster pace. Um, so we are, um, our work is well aligned with that way of thinking. And our starting point and focus is the flourishing business canvas. Um, I don't think I need to go through the, the canvas because you, you well know the tool, I think. Um, so um, shortly, um, um, shortly said, it's a major um, improvement in comparison of the business model canvas, which is widely spread in practice. Um, and the ideal world will be if it actually spreads it as such wide as, as uh, the business model canvas. However, uh, it takes a much broader perspective than the business model canvas. Um, it incorporates a system perspective, taking a wider stakeholder perspective um, and um, introduces the fact that companies are embedded in three contexts, the economy, society, and the environment, and explicitly um, enters 
enters this system perspective thinking uh, while co when companies are working with their um, existing business models or creating their new business models. So this was kind of our starting point. Um, and um, as we, you already uh, understood, uh, the three of us are members of the Strongly Sustainable uh, Business um, Community. Um, and um, we met as three explorers that had basically the same interest. Um, and um, after discussing our work, we realized that uh, we have been, um, we have been um, having um, similar ideas and similar um, uh, direction of our research, you could say. Um, I'll come back to that uh, a little bit later. Um, so how we are thinking a little bit on, on the uh, theoretical part. Um, so um, our view is on what the business model innovation is differs quite much uh, on uh, the product development inspired way of seeing business model innovation, um, as if there is a certain stages that the companies are going through and then there is a definite event, a certain event that marks, okay, now we have the new business model. Instead, uh, we are taking this integrative view of business model innovation that Lars suggested, and uh, we see it as a integrated logic um, of value proposition, creation, and exchange, uh, which is embodied in the cognition of managers and employees in the in the company and the stakeholders that uh, we are uh, have the company is having. It is materialized in the artifacts that the company is uh, creating, um, and it is also enacted uh, through the activities through the activity system that uh, the company undertakes. And all these, all these three aspects are influencing each other and are in a constant flux. So the business model innovation is kind of an in, uh, incremental change and incremental, uh, stay, um, incremental um, uh, innovation of organizational uh, becoming. So uh, you see that, for example, artifacts uh, inform cognition and at the same time, cognition is expressed in artifacts. So all these three are all the time influencing each other. So there is not a really predetermined phase uh, that you could see, okay, now the business model, the new business model is implemented. It's the ongoing um, incremental innovation activity, I could say. Um, and um, there has been a lot of research when it comes to uh, cognition um, and uh, how it influences um, artifacts. Um, and Ebner and Hoffman have discussed that um, uh, managers can develop and communicate quite different mental images depending on how they visually represent the business model. Um, and those visual representation basically are helping uh, with overcoming uh, different challenges, uh, cognitive challenges related to different uh, inputs of information, uh, social challenges um, um, uh, related uh, to involvement of different stakeholders, for example, um, and um, emotional challenges related to engagement um, and dedication uh, uh, in the process. Uh, but all this, in, in order to be able to overcome these challenges uh, through the visual representations, um, it all depends on the proper use and application of the visualization tools for business model innovation that we, we use. So if uh, the visualizations and the tool that we are using uh, are too complex, uh, they might actually create an illusion that we have created an understanding and might cause more um, uh, confusion instead of clarifying uh, the options that uh, we are looking at. Um, and um, 
related to, um, uh, to this discussion, uh, we are coming into tools that um, research has also uh, looked at the fact that um, while we have created a lot of business modeling tools that are out there, no matter if we are talking mainstream business modeling or business modeling for sustainability, um, and all those are really hands-on, practice-oriented, um, we know very little how practitioners uh, are actually understanding those and how they are used. Um, and um, additionally, very little attention has been focused on the effective design of those, which eventually uh, hinders the widespread of wide diffusion of the tools that we are creating. Um, usually uh, practitioners are attending a workshop or two, start using it and then um, abandon it if those are too complex and difficult to, to, uh, to use. So um, now a little bit to our um, common teams that um, um, Francesca and me and then Nicole independently identified. Um, while we started to speak with Nicole, we were quite astonished to, to realize that we have come up to very similar uh, conclusions uh, quite independently in different contexts. So our three main uh, common themes that we have identified in our work prior to this particular research that we are pre presenting today is that uh, when it comes to the flourishing business canvas, the graphic design um, is not quite clear. The connections between the different parts, the different building blocks in the canvas are not, not really clear uh, for the users. Um, the language um, is complex and um, it's difficult to distinguish between building blocks and understand what uh, different building blocks are um, in particular, what, what is expected to, to, to think about within each uh, space. And then there is a large amount of complexity. While the canvas is building the, the latest um, uh, science, uh, both from environmental and social science, this introduces a lot of complexity. Um, and especially the fact that all the three contexts, environment, society, and economy needs to be considered at the same time. Um, and um, um, so like the, those three teams are basically um, hindering the usability of the canvas and eventually the, the adoption in, in practice, the wider adoption in practice. Um, so uh, what we, um, our overall purpose um, with the study, with the ongoing study that uh, we are presenting now is uh, to see how we can, how the flourishing business canvas can be made more usable and increase its adoption uh, subsequently. Um, and basically the, the particular um, uh, purpose is to improve the flourishing business canvas through design. Um, and for doing that, uh, we, um, iteratively um, uh, tested, evaluated, and redesigned um, uh, the tool, the Flourishing Business Canvas, in three different contexts. So we created uh, a design process uh, for our, so as we call it, a triple experiment. So we had, <laughs> uh, we had um, uh, workshops in Belgium, uh, in Sweden, and then in, in Canada. Um, and we, in each of those experiments, uh, we were trying to um, understand two things, how users actually use the canvas uh, and what kind of outcomes emerge from uh, using the canvas. Uh, in each experiment or after each iteration, a different version of the canvas is used based on what insights we got um, after, uh, after its uh, workshop. Um, and we wanted to compare um, all the version with the new ones in terms of how we are, how users are using it and what outcomes emerge. Um, so once again, the Flourishing Business Canvas uh, is our starting point. So this is our starting point and uh, this is uh, our 
ending point as it looked after the last workshop uh, in, uh, in Canada with Nicole. Um, there is a little bit of more developments to, to it, but uh, we will finish up with them. Um, and uh, now I will hand over to Nicole to unpack a little bit uh, the method um, and um, guide you how we ended up here in the Flourishing Business Canvas 2.1. Okay, Nicole, the floor is yours. Thank you, Maya. Uh, so, so now we're gonna get into the design cycle. So, so Peter mentioned a little bit about what our methodology is. So research through design. So I have to really appreciate Peter's knowledge at this point as we were moving through. Um, and as he mentioned, a lot of the things we were doing were very intuitive at the time. Uh, so we were spending a lot of time observing, uh, recognizing that we had both process and artifacts. So I wanna be really clear that even though that you're looking at the redesign and we were looking at the canvas there's also stuff that emerged around the actual process as well too and we're going to address that a little later on so the overall methodology is something called research through design uh, it is a cited methodology um, it comes out of um, the computer uh, hci so human computer interaction world so a lot of um oh oh i sorry that's sorry. okay <laughs> Sorry. That's part of the research through design process where yes. you're prototyping. Yes. Um, so, uh, so this is a really, you're starting to border into the world of sort of engagement. So things that UX designers, uh, UI designers are looking at when they're looking at engagements and sort of interfaces. Um, so the idea was, is that um, one of the things that we were trying to, to look at was just, you know, research through design. So, you know, as it takes an iterative approach, and as Amaya mentioned, we'll go through that. Um, so the next slide is the overall methodology. And then ah. I guess, oh, that's okay. Sorry, I need to, um, my computer froze. I need to uh, stop sharing and share again. Sorry about that. That's okay. So I see we got some comments here i'll just go over to the simon's been very active in the comments in the chat so um okay. excellent okay so simon can we uh, uh can we answer those sort of like is there anything you want to ask at this point like no I, I think um i just wanted to like balance your critiques because i think what i'd like to do is just say that the flourishing canvas has a lot of intuitive appeal and so what i see your uh, research doing is um expanding on that rather than just kind of pointing out the problems with it. I'm, I'm really looking forward to this. I think your approach is absolutely excellent. Okay, cool. So <laughs> yeah, no, I like it. No, and, and honestly, like the intuitive part, um, I know from my perspective, as we were going through this, and that's kind of what Peter was alluding to, that we didn't take a traditional approach, um, was really that ability to really flow. And I think that's sort of indicative of flourishing from what I start to understand and recognize it that the canvas itself while it has a lot of that rigor attached to it there is an intuitive aspect i think we don't always uncover or address and so the research of how we were going through this was sort of that ability to show that um and it sort of became its own meta i think in a lot of ways so um cool so we're just going to go through a recap of <laughs> okay cool yes. all right uh, yeah, so the idea was is you, we took the canvas, we tested it in each of these workshop iterations, we did an analysis, then we redesigned it and we just repeated the process three times. So we'll go to the next slide then because everybody's like, what did you do to the canvas? <laughs> so here it is. So this is, this is, these are the three stages we went through. As you can see in Belgium, we started with the flourishing canvas um, and we did our first iteration. So there's really one thing. So you're looking at sort of the right hand side here. So what happened here was, when, we, when I was working with Peter and Anthony on the design of this, it was really starting to just be about lightening up the canvas. But as we got deeper into it and we started to understand it, it's like it's more than that. And the biggest realization at this point was recognizing that uh, participants are being asked to use a two-dimensional tool to design in three dimensions. And the best equation I can give to this is Spock when he plays three-dimensional chess on Star Trek. And I just got this vision in my head about that's kind of what's going on here. And what we're asking them to do is they're asking them to play this three dimensional chess on a two dimensional tool. So the first introduction you'll see at the bottom here, are what we call the hex cards and the hex cards were the first attempt to sort of actually put the dimensionality back into the canvas. So 
what we did is we said, okay, so you want to model. So why don't we, why don't we build these cards in each of the three contexts and then allow the participants to be able to move that around and have a conversation. So we did that in Belgium. And so, so it was the first awkward thing that happened and you know, people are trying to figure out not only the, like the canvas and flourishing and the tool, but now you've got these hex cards worked out. It was good. We got a lot of good feedback. So we went to Sweden and we did the same thing, but this time we kind of mixed it up a bit. Um, so we gave the, we gave, so what we did in Sweden is we went really crazy. We said, okay, great. We'll just use the canvas with the lightened up version. So one team, so one group of teams just got the canvas. Then what we did is we put the, the, you know, the, the prompt questions, we put those back on the canvas and we gave those to, we gave those to the team. So we gave them with a set of hex cards and the prompt questions. Okay. And then what we did really crazy, we gave one set of team, we only gave them the cards, the hex cards, and they had the questions on them. And so we really kind of blew that out to see what would happen with all the tools. Then we came back to Canada. Okay. And we were like, after we saw a lot of how the hex cards were being used, we're like, why don't we just make the canvas hex? Like, why don't we really push the envelope? and take the boxes away and put the hexagon cards in because what we were starting to see happen was we were changing the way people were having conversations around the, the canvas. So, and Peter was the one that kind of pointed this one out and Peter, you can jump in if you want to address this was more like you had mentioned, like we're still using the same ontology, but we're changing the epistemology of how we're using the canvas. And I don't know, Peter, if you wanted to address that because you were the one who sort of pointed that out. Um, in terms of what we did to the canvas with sort of this new design? Well, it can become a, a big change. Um, it isn't yet because we don't, we, we haven't distributed the canvas, you know, with a new license approach and to the first explorers. We're starting to see that because this is, um, it, 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 what we're doing is allowing people to use the concepts first to creatively construct the concepts in a looser way and then to adapt those concepts into the frame rather than letting the frame of um of the perspectives uh you know in the contexts um um kind of kind of create it um almost as more of a a flow chart approach which is i think how the original canvas um kind of kind of constructed more of a top down uh, approach which which can be easy for a lot of people to follow I mean we're used to you know everything from form filling to following flow charts to following a really nicely designated kind of structure but the epistemology is different here in that and we think that this is this is more um, inductive uh, that is bottom up and parts first and that that might be more in line with what a lot of small business people really do, who aren't going to know the language or know why things are structured the way they are, but might might be able to work with the parts um, as pieces that, as they come to recognize some parts and then others, mm -hmm. they can connect those in in the conversation. And I think that's along the lines of what you observed when when you did these workshops. Eh? Yeah. So Maya, on the next well, slide. Sorry, sorry to step in. Uh, Simon just said in the chat that he has a question, and I thought this might be a good point to address that question. Yeah, I think it's really relevant here. If you look at the original uh, Flourishing Canvas kit, if you look at the instructions that I think Anthony wrote, it was really interesting. He suggested that in terms of the methodology, you take any three different questions and you ask people in an exercise to really talk about the connections between those three different um, dimensions of the canvas. Did you use any of that here? Because I'm just looking at the hexagons and what you've designed really can help that type of questioning, finding um, these you know, causal connections between three disparate parts of the canvas. Yeah, no, that's again. So in the kit, so when we did the the so when we constructed the workshops both in Sweden and Canada, we actually followed what Anthony put in the kit. So I know that a lot of different practitioners have different approaches that they've used over the years. Like they've developed their own processes and their own approaches. But in order for us to sort of replicate and duplicate as much as we possibly could, 
with the context of what we were already given, we actually went to Anthony's deck that was in the kit. And so my, if you go to the next slide here, um, you'll see like, so what we did is, the idea is, was we actually followed it, it so that the workshops were all day long. And what we did is we took people through each stage of that deck that Anthony had built in the flourishing, like in, in the first Explorer kit that you have. And we'll show you that a little later in the mural that we did. But you're right. So what happened was, is the idea was you could take the cards you wanted. So the, 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 the white cards here, they have the question on them. So they have the prompt question that you would have normally seen in the box. And then what you would do is the bolded words actually connote the pieces that you're working with, right? So in this case, it's stakeholders. You want the cards that relate to, to actors, stakeholders, and value co-creation. And now you know what you're actually modeling with. And that was so to answer, I hope that answers your question, but we did follow what was in the first Explorer kit. No, that's great. I, I really like your design methodology. It's excellent work. You can thank Peter because he was the advisor. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, so, so it, it, is there any other questions on that? So that just, we just wanted to show you, like, I know we sort of really highlighted the hex yeah. card. There's we more. We actually do have one more question from Panos. Oh so, yeah. Sorry about that. <clears throat> really yeah. clar clarifying question. So in this case, stakeholders, you're actually, <clears throat> you're saying, you know, this piece is connected to these other two pieces, right? So you're basically like simplifying the whole thing. And you know, so, so if you're working with stakeholders, these are the two other nodes or three other nodes that this piece is connected to. So you don't have to worry about, for example, you know, biophysical stocks now. You're in this, you know, node of the network. It, it seems like it's a more network, you know, a, well, it seems to me like a no more networked approach to the canvas, is it? Yeah, like, and, and you know, it's funny afterwards, um, like there's a lot of after hindsight <laughs> that happens. Um, because we took such an intuitive approach mm -hmm. and you're right. And so afterwards, like, um, when we were working on it and we were looking at how the, the cards were being assembled, like Maya identified, like, this is really cool. Look, like you've got a lot of blue cards. So now you're completely biased into mm. like the economy aspect. And, but the crazy thing about it is, yeah, you'd only be working in the nodes of those three, but then what would happen is you'd pull the next card, like in a game. So you'd pull the next question card. And then that next question card would then make you build out the other nodes because now you'd be working with the relationships. So like, as you can see here on the left hand side, no, the right hand, right hand, right hand side, right. I'm really bad with left and right. Don't ever drive with me, you'll get lost. Um, so the, in the, the hexagon thing here, you're seeing like people are actually building it out. And then what we realized then is what it did to the canvas itself. The canvas actually became the bike rack. Right. So what you could do is you could pick the narratives and, you know, and Nandine actually pointed this out when we had a bit of a call, she pointed out, you could pick out the time frame of the narratives. So like if you built out a narrative that is today, you could put that on the canvas and say, that's our today narrative. Or if you build out a narrative that ended up being five years in the future, you could identify that and then pull that out of the cards and put it onto the canvas. Right. So now the canvas becomes sort of almost like your bike rack or your, your presentation mode of these are the narratives that we as a group have decided are are going to be able to walk us through the canvas right so these are just some of the things that we were really starting to sort of identify and so yes your question when we look back at it, i'm like yeah damn it's like systems right like we just basically you know we're, we're mapping out the system in a weird way so um i don't know if that answers that oh, question sure and the white card the white cards are like the process cards so you know modeling so steps yeah okay yeah they're like the question cards so the idea was is we had um it's kind of hard to see in these pictures but what we did is we actually had the what would happen is we would throw up on the screen we'd say okay you're going to be working with these three questions or you're going to be working with these these cards so you would pull the questions to that you would ask the question and then you would model and you would reduce. so what would happen was you'd use the cards to respond to the questions that were on the white cards you'd use the color cards to respond to the question that was on the white card and then uh, you um, um, we didn't really mention that the colors are also indicating so the green the green are uh, the environmental um, uh, system the blue is uh, the, uh, the economy and then society represent the, the uh, yeah 
orange yellow uh, color. So as Nicole said, it's really easy to see if the group discussion is more biased towards any of the system and it's kind of a self-correction mechanisms, for example. Okay, we don't, we haven't really touched upon on the social context and uh, we need to, to, to try to work uh, with it a little bit more. Um, so essentially really capturing um, narratives um, and as Panos pointed out a little bit, covering the same process as with the triads that uh, Anthony has uh, developed, but with some good positive um, um, effect as well as uncovering biases, for example. So on that note, I was just gonna say, um, my, do we want to go to the next slide and we can talk about the data that we gathered just so that people that we're still trying to go through. <laughs> FYI. Yes, uh, yes. <laughs> um, so uh, the data that we gathered, we extensively documented the use of the canvas uh, with um, tons of uh, photographs in, in all three um, experiments, um, as well as the, the photos of the final canvas narratives. Uh, we, in Belgium, um, we are having um, a written reflection on the usability of the canvas, while in Sweden and Canada we, we have a survey that was uh, filled in. And as we mentioned, uh, it is an ongoing uh, research, uh, so we are not uh, ready yet. So uh, we are at the point that we have all this data and we are trying to um, actually uh, figure out how to, to analyze it. Um, and uh, what we have come up um, up to that point is that we will actually want to use the, the um, um, LASH uh, network on the integrative uh, view of business model innovation uh, combined with work on the uh, sustainability of uh, as flourishing this different criteria that have been identified by Brewer et al. I think if I'm not wrong, Nicole, um, and maybe you can um, continue explaining what else we are combining those with. <laughs> Great, so yeah, so as Maya said, we had a ton of data, and so we had a lot of discussions around, like, th so this model here, obviously it's firm context. So we had a lot of, um, and we recognized there were sort of three main nodes in sort of this model. And what we were trying to do is we were trying to sift through, um, you know, all the data and lump it into, obviously we have artifacts. So we actually have the physical artifact of the canvas, but then we also have the process by which the canvas is delivered in and how it's now it's being used. And then obviously then we have the cognition part about, you know, how are we communicating and understanding now? So how are these all working together? Like Maya had said in the beginning. So is it, a, you know, maybe it's not just one evaluation, but it's it's several evaluations combined together, depending on, you know, sort of where the tool is at and where the process is. So we started to take a look at things like uh, the evaluation methods, usability heuristics, like so if you're developing a tool or we're working with the tool, perhaps then the interface is, uh, you know, usability heuristics. And so it's expertise, right? Then in terms of the activity side of things, so in the process or the interaction, and we want it to be more human centered in terms of the activity, maybe we're now looking at you know, ISO evaluations, we're looking at human factor evaluations. And then the sustainability is flourish, uh, as flourishing, so a lot of the work that um, is coming sort of out in, in the sort of pattern work that is being looked at is, okay, so yeah, you, you're doing, you've got the tools nailed down, you've got the process nailed down, but then you've got this whole understanding of what is sustainability and flourishing in your company. And so then what do your managers need in terms of their framework to really understand and define so that when they are modeling and doing the processes that, you know, they actually are modeling properly for flourishing with the tools based upon the ontology. So we realized that, holy crap, now we've got this whole, like, now we've got, it wasn't just about the canvas. We, I mean, we all just showed up to sort of look at the canvas, but what we realized is we peeled back all these layers and we recognize again, systemically, it's really about if we're going to design tools, if we're going to design tools for flourishing, we kind of have to look at the whole system of the firm and how that gets integrated. And the tools are just one piece of the conversation, but the tools drive the conversation and drive the activities. So they have to be developed in context 
to the things that we want to achieve. So one of the things that Maya, uh, Francesca and I are now starting to discuss is, well, maybe it's a, maybe it's a, it's a design system, right? For how we qualify the tools we use and the approach we take to the tools within the firm uh, to achieve the outcomes we want. So these are some of the other things that we're sort of now looking at with the data that are not just about the, the canvas anymore, but you know, the actions around the canvas. And then that's at one point we were like, okay, we need to just go have a beer now and here's the canvas. <laughs> so <laughs> um, anyway, so Maya, did you want to kind of? Yeah, well, um, and in terms if we kind of try to, um, from a management science perspective now, uh, because uh, Nicole is kind of outlined some of our contributions or intended contributions uh, from the design science. But from a management science perspective, we, we um, um, are contributing with this work or intend to contribute with this work with the process view of uh, visualization, not the mere outcome, uh, but the sense making activity that is uh, taking place and the collaborative uh, work. Um, and um, the other con intended contribution that um, uh, we are um, having is the theory to, to the theory of boundary ob uh, objects or how the flourishing business canvas or any type of tool for that matter can be a catalyst and inspiration for capturing different knowledge and perspective in this process. How, um, how we can, um, uh, what is the role of, uh, of the canvas and the process and the design system that you were mentioning about. Um, and um, the future steps that uh, we are um, thinking about, obviously lots of analysis of the gathered data. Uh, we will continue to work with uh, um, uh, refining the, the design. Uh, we really would like to iterate and test uh, the full um, user journey. Um, and uh, the final one um, is uh, to basically think um, what around this whole system that is related to that. And uh, I think Nicole is now um, going to introduce the mural that represents a first attempt um, um, of thinking systematically. Um, will you send us the link to the mural? Yeah. I think so, I'll stop sharing. Yeah, so this is, um, I don't know, if, uh, as you, you may or may not be familiar with Mural. I know Anthony has built uh, the previous, like the existing canvas. There is a, it is in Mural. Uh, so with COVID, obviously, it was kind of like, great, nobody's going to be able to use the hex cards for like a year. Um, so one of the things that we were looking at then is the next iteration around the process. So what I did is I, I, I posted a link here. You can click on it. You can go into Mural. Um, oh, cool. You're all in here. It's cool. I can see everybody. Um, you all show up as different animals. So it's kind of cool. Uh, just like in Google. Um, and so in here, you can start to um, go around. So what we did here in this mural is we took the canvas redesign, but actually encoded it in the process that we use. So this was actually a replication and duplication of the workshops we ran in the process. We ran in uh, Sweden and Canada. It's based upon the workshop that you'll find in your first explorers folder. But what was really cool about it was we could start to add in more things, right? So when we were talking about, say, like biophysical stocks, I could put in the periodic table of um, endangered elements. I could put in something related to the ecosystem services. So a lot of the uh, incendiary uh, feedback that we got about the canvas, like we need an instruction manual, we need an IKEA manual, how do we walk through it? Knowing that practitioners take different approaches to the canvas, but a lot of the feedback we got was where do we start, where do we start, where do we start? And, you know, and everybody's always reticent, well, not to tell you where to start, but practitioners will generally, depending on their method or their process, will, will take a starting point. So this was an opportunity to try to replicate and duplicate not only the canvas, but the cards, but also like, are there opportunities to expand, um, you know, the knowledge. So a little bit of the glossary of terms at the bottom, not every single um, unit, but sort of the, the ones that people had the most trouble with in terms of the ontology. Um, the idea that, uh, you know, like just adding links, like we could add videos and different things. So just some, 
this is a really rough idea, but um, the other cool thing about it is with Mural is what you can do with Mural, it's got the arrows, right? So you can really start to take those hex cards, put them together and then, you know, move them over to the canvas or draw, you can really start to now draw the links. So the visual links, so you can get really concrete about the stories you're telling and the links you're making. So this was sort of our next iteration to sort of, you know, ex continue to explore the interface and the engagement, not so much the design, but the engagement. Um, and this is just, we're just sort of dipping our toe in the water here. So you guys are willing to like goof around in here, uh, play around, grab stuff if you want to pull it. Some of it might be locked down, some of it may not, uh, <laughs> but feel uh, free. Nicole? Yeah? yeah? Would you maybe be able to share your screen? I'm just thinking for the uh, recording oh. so we can, we can see that on the recording as well. Yeah, so people are now at the recording like, what are they looking at? What are yeah. they looking at? Okay. <laughs> exactly. Okay, so um, yeah, I write your recording. So uh, let me just see. So can everybody Perfect. see that okay? Yeah. Okay, there we go. Okay, so as you can see here, um, well, there's a couple things. So number one, we have on the outline side here, uh, what we did is this is basically the workshop. These are basically the slides of the workshop. So how we took people through, the, through uh, how we guided them through. So for instance, like set your future date. Um, it would jump to this area of the canvas and it would give you the information so that you could walk through it. Um, brainstorm your why, right? So this is all kind of pulled out of the first Explorer, um, taking you to the model. Um, so you can watch the video of Anthony talk about the different contexts. Uh, you can zoom out, um, right? Uh, takes you to the different areas of the canvas as well too. So you can jump to sort of those different areas um, and it obviously walks you through about resources, it asks the questions, all those sort of things, right? So you can really kind of guide yourself through it. Again, this was an, a play on engagement, not so, much, um, not so much on the design of the canvas, but more designing around the engagement of the canvas. Again, uh, we've got the hex cards over here. So you can grab, these were all grouped together so you could actually start to to build these out and then you can sort of, you know, you can sort of type in, uh, you know, be good, right? Uh, you know, be, a, you know, costs less. Um, so you could start to sort of engage those and then when you were sort of done, um, you could then move those sort of over to, you, you could sort of park that um, into the area of the canvas where you needed to go, right? Um, and then the other cool thing about it is once you were sort of done, you could take a shape, right? And you could start to connect the dots across the canvas to tell your story. Um, so again, engagement, and these were just some of the things that we were starting to look at. Uh, some other things that we noted from our research um, were the glossary of terms. So this is where we were going in and really getting an opportunity to actually define some of these things that were really tough for people to wrap their heads around, particularly if you were an SME, uh, if you're a small to medium sized business, like some of the things like ecosystem services, that's probably the first time in your life you've ever heard about ecosystem services. Um, and so, you know, value co-destruction, like that concept onto itself with a small to medium sized enterprise kind of just like, you know, it's such, it's so pivotal to the flourishing canvas. Uh, how do you sort of work with that? So that was another thing that we sort of uh, looked at. Um, places for reflection and observation. That was another thing we noticed within the workshops that people needed a lot of time to process. And so within each of our stages, we actually gave a 10 minute discussion round or a reflection round. And we actually found that a lot of people ended up putting a lot more sticky notes down. Uh, so we just wanted a, a parking lot or a bike rack area where they could go. Um, and then again, just some, you know, some just showing some ways in which these hexagon cars were being used um, as well. So. Any questions on that? Thanks, Nicole. Yeah, we actually do have two questions in the chat and I also have a question. We'll uh, start with Simon, who was first. Uh, Simon asked if we can access this version by our mural accounts to play with it. Um, as Peter mentioned, it has not been released in license. So, but if you would like to play around with it, um, I'm happy to give you access via the Georgian College mural account. Okay, if that's, I mean, I'm, I'm assuming that that's okay, then uh, we, we just, I mean, yeah, <laughs> he says thanks. 
Um, so I guess we will uh, connect you to the participants of today. Um, and uh, <laughs> Laurie says she would like access to, and then maybe you could send it out to them personally, if that's all right. Yeah, so I just need a list of people and what we can do is we can, we'll um, yeah, I can, I can give you a guest access or, or whatever, or also happy to too, like we did with you, Tim, um, set up a, a couple times where people really wanted to kind of get in and play or ask questions. Uh, <laughs> happy to do that as well too. That's great. Thanks so much, Nicole. Um, I would say for anyone who's interested, why don't you put your email addresses, if, if you feel comfortable doing so, in the, in the Zoom chat. Uh, if not, just let me know personally and, uh, and I'll make sure to forward it to Nicole. Okay. Did Maya or Peter, did you want to chime in on any of that? Oh, well, I think this is good. I'm glad there's interest and I'm, I'm, um, I'm not sure what our time frame is going to be for um, figuring out the licensing for distribution from here. We've been, you know, between... Um, you know, the, the, the kind of delays and hold up with everything this year and the, and the, the difficulty in collaboration. Um, you know, what we, we have, I think, really excellent and, uh, you know, um, updates to the canvas that, that could be released right now as, as the new version. Um, you know, Anthony was your, so I, I, if we didn't say really clearly be, before, you know, Anthony Uppert is Nicole's um, uh, committee member. And so the agreements that, that have been made around the canvas are, are fairly binding. That is, we're all very happy with it. We'd like to see, uh, we'd like to go forward with it. But we don't, we don't have the ability to, right now, to set the right license and, and kind of roll it out. So this is, this is still an, uh, an early sharing of, of the new canvas. And, you know, and my, my thoughts on this are that we need, you know, we need to look at, a, at an immediate, um, you know, that is in the next month or two, a, a type of interim license that will work for, for this and to get it in the hands of the first explorers so they can start using it, perhaps on a transfer from the existing product. Uh, but this is, you know, go, going to present an important new direction as we also work on um, and the flourishing enterprise toolkit, you know, the approach to the, the kind of recommended practices based on the years of working with, um, you know, the existing canvases, we now need to update that with, with the new canvases and what we've learned from your research. My idea. Yeah. Thanks, Peter. I was just going to say, my, do you want to, do you have anything to add? Cause, um, on that. Not really. I um, I think uh, if uh, it's okay, it's good to kind of play around and give a little bit more fa feedback because then um, we get new perspective that we haven't thought about and um, important input. Um, but uh, um, as uh, Peter says, there is a lot of uh, work to be done with the license um, yet. So, I mean, if it doesn't really... Um, um, contradicts with the license. I, I think playing around and giving input as part of the research and improvement work is okay. Yeah, and, and some of it is the branding and the rollout. I mean, there's there's really a new, there's a new palette, you know, there would be a new logo. I mean, there's a huge amount of work that went into this or that evolved out of this that and what, um, uh, so between the MRP and kind of the study, which is now, um, so Nicole, is your, is your, I checked about a month or two ago, and I wasn't able to find your uh, MRP coming up on open research. So let me see if we can find that. We really, we need to start somewhere with, with sharing this and, you know, um, sharing the actual work and the artifacts. So, um, I mean, so the branding and, and, you know, the new branding and the marketing is going to take, um, you know, it's going to take a bit of an effort. And so uh, if anyone's interested in contributing to that, let me know. But, you know, we need our core team to really talk about this as well. Um, so, you know, with Anthony and everything. So let me um, see if I can find your, um, your MRP, Nicole, and put a link. 
Um, just to jump in quick, there, there appears to be a lot of interest um, also on a follow-up session, um, just as an idea, and we can discuss this further, but, but seeing the amount of interest, what we could also do is just to dedicate another um, monthly meeting to playing around with the canvas and to have more of an interactive session, exactly what you were suggesting, Nicole, but to have that as, as our next monthly meeting. Um, that, that could be one idea, but I definitely think judging by the responses here in the chat that people are interested in, in having a session to play around with the canvas and get to know it better. Yeah, happy to, you know, happy to, to support that and doing it at different times. So our, okay. <laughs> our European team members, uh, we can swap so we okay. can be up late at night and they can be, uh, like during the day so happy to um happy to oblige different time zones as well too um yeah so um the other side of this too is i believe you know maya and francesca are going to and i'm working right now with georgian Maya, don't know this yet but uh working right now with, with to get a class so the, the 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 amazing work that maya and francesca have been doing have been looking at it from a pedagogical standpoint or i guess an andragogical standpoint uh, you know, about around teaching. And so going into the fall, um, you know, sort of the fall term, the next terms, um, you know, sort of releasing it with the students again and getting them to play with it. Um, so I don't know, you know, we've got some academic partners on the, on the call, like if there's an opportunity to, to test it with different student groups, um, you know, that's always a possibility as well too. Um, and we can, we can also do that, you know, I guess that's within the confines of the license as well, too, I would assume, Peter. Uh, yeah, uh, so, so Colin, you're saying, is this something we could test in the fall with the University of Ghent? Yeah, so that's where Francesca is. Um, and I guess that would be a Francesca question. Yes. Yeah. But we can, um, um, if you send us our, your email, we can connect you with Francesca so you can discuss directly. Yeah, and yeah, and Panos too uh, from our brief uh, weird encounter in Barry Park in a Barry Park. <laughs> uh, happy to happy to support the SFI program as well too, um, you know, and come in. So nice, so. awesome. Um, just trying to catch up on some of the comments um, that and questions we had earlier. Panos was asking if you could provide an example of how the hex graphs can be used outside the canvas. So uh, yeah, wanna, the exploration, yeah. the exploration space, like a sort of example, you know, how, how things are connected, if there's something that you know. Um, see you, Stephen. Um, um, yeah, so in the group that we used in Sweden, they didn't, they didn't have any of the canvas. All they had was the, um, the hex card. So we have pictures of that and it was wild what they did. <laughs> Like it was crazy what they did and they did, they used it as I will idea. try to dig one. Sorry. Yeah. Um, and that would be our best Thanks. example that we can send to you. But there was one group that that's all they had was just the cards. Because sometimes you could you see something just to get your mind working, right? You know, you said before, you know, be good. Okay. That sounds like a goal, you know, cost less. Hmm. You know, is that a goal now? Is that a cost? You know, it's a, so how would you use that? You know, just to get our minds around this. Yeah, so how did they use it with the people that actually tried it, right? <laughs> yeah, well, the one thing we found that when they did that group that did had no canvas to park to, um, what I thought was really interesting about them is they, well, at first they kind of freaked out a bit. They were sort of like, oh my God, there's no framework. And then they were like, wait a minute, this is like the coolest thing ever because I have no framework and we can do anything. And you're right. What they started to do is they didn't get confined by what uh, Peter was saying, how we're, you know, taught to be like, fill the box, fill the box, fill the box. Once they got really comfortable with sort of the ambiguity, they actually then designed their own rules. And then they made their own decisions about how they were going to qualify decisions, right? So did they want to qualify that as a cost? Right. And so what ended up happening is once they sort of rewrote their coding and reckon gave themselves agency, they rewrote their own rules. Um, but again, the people that were in that group too had a high sophistication design, a design background. So um, it was really about agency. Um, 
And so the groups you're working with, I think it depends on the facilitators. If you gave them those tools, you would have to really empower them with agency to make up their own situation. There you go. Wow. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, see how they wrote at the top, like problem, solutions, benefits. Like they really started to kind of construct their own, uh, their own thinking with the cards. And what's remarkable is this was done without training them in this process, right? You gave them a, a, a challenge. They collaborated to develop these approaches, and so this is what emerged with with that team in the workshop, right? Yes. I mean, it wasn't directed in this way. What I what I think is going to be remarkable about being that could develop within an organization that uses um, the hex cards in a sophisticated way, and it would take some training to do this, is that we could use um, some we could use business strategy and innovation theory as a way to um, really enhance the business model thinking with respect to how these kinds of coded frameworks are set up is one of the one of the key aspects i mean so we we often think of flourishing as as a way you know as, as a way to create uh, to to create kind of the prefer the preferable approach to the emergence of of uh, strong sustainability capacity and 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 flowbacks from resource use um, in the ecosystem that that a, that a, that a business is participating in. But when we look at the social context, there's so, there's so much complexity that could be accounted for that we usually just ignore. We, I mean, you know, in, so in the, in the flourishing business model context, now, like, we could open up the entire, um, all of the boxes to one of the colors. So you could look at, at this, you know, the, the social system design, the yellow, uh, in essence, for every, for every node, for every box in the canvas. And then you could relate that in different ways to the economic uh, processes within the business. Now, as, as someone had mentioned before about the relationships, maybe it was Griff, but you could start to see how these could start to stack in different ways that you can even add multiple um, you could start to add um, how you could show how resources are flowing between them, which would be interesting. That would be more like a, you know, like a, a um, um, causal loop diagram or system flows, which I think would be really helpful for sustainability analysis. But what you could do in terms of the business strategy is start to identify really unique encodings of you know, using this process, that would be really hard to do on the flat canvas. That would speak to people in the organization, but wouldn't have any meaning to anybody else. And why that's powerful, I mean, that's kind of the essence of, of uh, an innovation, uh, of a knowledge strategy. Because, uh, so one of, the, one of the meaningful ways to, um, to produce innovations that are not replicable by your competitors that is from an economic perspective, you could say, is to develop inimitable strategies that have very unique, um, that are based on very unique knowledges within the organization. You could start to show those relationships in this type of model now. I, mean, I know this is beyond what we've talked about before, but this is the picture that, that, that gets us to thinking. And so Maya is, a, you know, is an innovation um, you know, um, scholar, you're, you're probably you know familiar with some of the research in, in resource-based view and in um, you know in distinctive competencies and and um, you know and 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 the creation of strategic knowledge that can be used for you know mul for different business models. So I, I wanted to to suggest that as a future research direction and as a way that you could also inspire. Um, more sophisticated companies, once they get beyond just kind of figuring out how you might move to a transition to a sustainable, more sustainable business models, is now how to really capitalize on your knowledge so that, you know, you're, you're really able to amplify um, what's learned around the organization to, 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 to present it in these new types of um, kind of knowledge frameworks. 
Absolutely. That's, uh, I'm just going through the chat. Um, yeah. I, I think those are really exciting new possibilities to use the canvas also. Um, Pam has just asked if you encountered any limitations with the hex shapes in terms of possibility of, of connections. Uh, I can let Maya answer that one too. Um, not, not explicitly. Hmm. Um, I think the biggest limitations would be um, the amount, it's only got six sides. So <laughs> that, that, that's what I'm talking about, you know, so yeah, <laughs> like a super node that I have to connect with so many things and yeah. So that's kind of where I was sort of, I, I, I don't know. I think I was talking to Peter about this, where then this weird, this weird concept of the hyperbolic plane came in where like a soccer ball, right. Where you would get so many connections and then you would find, then you would actually add in a, a multi-sided figure, like in a soccer ball. So that then you could add that many more connections to it. So like, I think down the road, if you got that sophisticated, you'd end up with another spacer, like you'd end up with another shape, like in hyperbolic geometry. Um, right. and like when you cut a soccer ball out. Um, and that was just sort of, you know, kind of, you're right, Pan, I was just thinking about limitations. Mm -hmm. And that kind of actually leads into another aspect of, you know, the decision around the hex cards was, you know, flourishing in its own, aspect is sort of biomimetic in its own way. So why are we using, you know, traditional boxes to represent something that actually is more biomimetic? Like, is there another way that we can express flourishing in our tools? And so when the hex cards came up, it was like, well, it makes more sense that it's a hive than it is, you know, a bunch of stacked blocks. So that was sort of a meta, but to answer your question, and you know, I don't know. <laughs> no, we haven't really noticed any explicit limitations at at, at that point. And, and maybe if, if you reach that point, maybe you're more modeling wrong. I don't know. Maybe you're overcomplicating things. Maybe you know, who knows? <laughs> Practice will tell, right? Maybe it's it's so complex, but maybe you're like going around in circles, and maybe you have to simplify your modeling. You know? Yeah, I I think you're. I think there's yeah there's. Uh, Again, like I think this is why we need to open it up to the community and we need more iterations. Like we need people to fumble through things and identify gaps because we've, we've, we're presenting a new approach to the canvas, right? Which is also going to present new complexities around, you know, things we would have never have come across, right? Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, so I was just, someone said, did you, uh, I was just looking at, did you add any questions beside the old ones that Anthony created? Uh, short no. Uh, no, but Peter, uh, we did go in and we might have tweaked a few and I believe Peter did a once over about a year ago on the question. So I might have tweaked a few in the glossary to make them more layman term. Um, but no, we didn't change the questions. No. Not substantively. We did try to simplify them, but I also say we do have different questions for, um, for the flourishing cities. The, the the canvas for for social or, or or civic policy, and so that version of the canvas does have um, does have a, a slightly different arrangements. Allows for a wider range of uh, of accountabilities of of uh, of benefits, costs, assets, and resources. So it's it's a slightly different model, and so so what we're looking at here is still, you know, the enterprise oriented model. But there is a, a lot of, I think, emerging interest in using these types of, you know, tools in ways that could be, um, we could use in constructive workshops for um, things like climate change planning at the mun municipal climate action planning and, and um, engaging citizens in, in, in stakeholder workshops with municipal planning and, and in policy. I think, I think this new kind of modeling the old canvas into this hex card system gives indeed a lot of new opportunities to adapt more easily and quickly to the purpose of, of workshops, of teams, or companies that want to work around something. And as you mentioned, uh, in, in Europe, the Green Deal is uh, picking up speed and 
this kind of tool would be very interesting to use in all kinds of strategies that uh, come around with, uh, or are starting now in, in Europe. And this this model is easier easier to adapt now and it's more flexible as you mentioned before. So the idea also of to make it a 3, 3D physically a 3D model is is is, is quite appealing. And I'm just thinking how this could be possible. But you could actually make it like little blocks. So you you build something with it and, and that would be even yeah, more interesting even to see what, what it would become uh, and you actually have the three D model. Is that something that, yeah. that you guys ever ever thought about? Um, actually making it 3D as a next iteration? Yeah, so it's funny because yes. Uh, so when we were originally in one of the conversations, I remember sitting with Peter and Anthony at OCAD, uh, we did kind of go down that rabbit hole. Um, it was a deep rabbit hole and my brain hurt afterwards, but yes, there were conversations about the three dimensionality. And I think that's where the interest in sort of the hyperbolic plane and how it curves um, kind of, we looked at it, but outside of that, we've had conversations, but how that would happen. Um, I need to, I would need more mathematics in my background. So if anybody would like to take that on, happy to uh, offer that gauntlet challenge down. <laughs> I, I just want to uh, throw in another question that was asked before, and thanks uh, to Josh for bringing it up again. So Simon asked earlier if this is going to be um, available eventually uh, on a Creative Commons basis, because that was the original or the plan for the original version. I think Anthony would have to answer that. I just gave her a, a response to that in the chat. Oh, is that, um, yeah. Well, I think eventually, yes. <laughs> However, we need, that's, I was hinting at that before, that will we'll need to sit down with Anthony and work out a custodial arrangement for kind of how the, the license is kept and shared. I think we do need a, a different arrangement. We do have a new canvas. Um, you know, life is, is moving on qu ahead quickly here. And, and this is a, a powerful tool that, you know, that, that we actually now have, you know, new knowledge that we have to share around using it. So now, you know, now we have to really think about how this is going to be rolled out. I think until we have a, a way to construct, uh, you know, to present the, you know, the, the new tools and as well as the existing tools and, and to present them, you know, on a website to make it down, to have a, a type of registration process for a download and the license that's associated with it. I mean, we just need to create something like that. Um, actually am interested in doing that and probably you know i have some support for that uh at ocad i would so um nicole you're no longer with us but maybe i need to get another um you know gra and maybe you could help me advise um you know a, a graduate you know a graduate research assistant in this step of of kind of developing the materials too it is something that we could do as an ocad sponsored project and I'm sure Maya would love to, if she can, like, I'm sure mm. it'd be nice to involve, like, Francesca and Maya, too, if there's a, like, to continue that. Um, don't know, I'm, like, like, totally throwing you out there, Maya, but. <laughs> oh, of course, I mean, as you mentioned, we continue the iteration now in the fall or planning for that. Um, so, you know, can't quite interested in this work, contribute to it. I mean, it'd be really great to see, like it would be great to see all the institutions actually work together on some level. I know that that sometimes is a hard thing to do, but I just, I think it'd be great. I mean, it was born out of sort of this, mm -hmm. like, I always, you know, there's always sort of, we always talk about the triple experiment, but really it was a quadruple experiment with OCAD, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, it'd be really nice to see the continuation of that, uh, you know, and when we talk about scale, like Peter, I don't know if there's an opportunity if that is something where funding could happen where you could get scale for that research. Uh, small amounts of funding right now, but I think we could get more if we just got going with it. What we we don't want to wait for, you know, a major funder right now. We I think we want to get get something started. So 
we should talk about that and how that it's on the table and that there's interest. And so, Tim, maybe we also ought to, put, uh, you know, put out into our future plans another workshop and to use that as kind of a hands-on workshop. We could also yeah. perhaps get, um, you know, invite, you know, actually affirmatively invite more uh, strategic foresight students that could engage with us then too. It can be, we don't get as many people for like an August SSBMG, but if we did more of a workshop approach with this, say, you know, in, in, in October or something. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. So I think the interest is definitely there. Um, so so we will we will share. I mean, also being mindful of the time now, um, we'll definitely share the addresses of everyone who was interested. Um, we'll figure out, I, I guess, probably a multitude of ways to to keep engaging because I, I do feel um, a, a definitely a higher level of of interest here and of engagement of everyone. So so I think it'll be great to keep that going. Um, if you guys need to jump off, feel free to jump off because the time officially is over. Um, if some of you, one of you could stay, I would also say uh, we could still uh, take one or maybe two questions if someone feels like um, there has been something that hasn't been addressed yet. Um, I'm happy to stay for a few minutes. I know Maya, it's like super late where you are. <laughs> it's the so. same for team, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's true. Uh, yeah. I'll stay on a few more minutes, yeah. yeah. I can also stay. Okay, more. me too. I'll go ahead and stop the recording so now we can say whatever you want. <laughs> <laughs>